Okay? I think we will slowly start. Um, it's a terrific honor and pleasure for me to uh, chair this session on um, uh, the uh, uh, way how hate speech actually migrates to the uh, new media services, to social media, online websites. So the other session is entitled From uh, Traditional Media to Social Media and New Technologies, How Has Hate Speech Migrated Online? And I think uh, the aim of this session will be focusing especially on three issues. One is how fast and how easily hate sp speech can be disseminated by the new uh, media services, including uh, social networks, including uh, different sort of websites. Uh, then we will also speak a little bit about the way how uh, different governments use uh, uh, measures and provisions to uh, ban actually freedom um, or free, free speech uh, through uh, measures and provisions on hate speech. And we will talk also about, I hope, some positive examples how to contract uh, hate speech in new media services. And we have uh, three distinguished speakers for this panel, for this session. Um, uh, and I would like to introduce uh, first of them, uh, Paul Lewis uh, from Guardian, from the United Kingdom, um, uh, is the editor of special pro projects in Guardian Daily. Uh, he has uh, rich experience in journalism and investigative reporting. Uh, he was named Reporter of the Year by the British Press Awards in 2010 and also won the uh, 2009 Bevins Prize for Outstanding Investigative Journalism. Uh, Paul will focus actually on the role of new technology and the way how new technology was used in 2011 English riots and I think he will uh, give us some uh, practical examples how the hate speech was disseminated by these new technologies. So Paul, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, and um, hello everybody. Uh, yeah, I wanted to take this opportunity to speak to you about a research project uh, that we have been involved in the last few months into the causes and consequences of, uh, of the riots that many of you will know about happened last August in England. Um, what makes this project unique is that it was a collaboration between a newspaper, my newspaper, The Guardian, and a leading university that runs the School of Economics. And it was done so with, I should mention, of course, uh, generous support from the Open Society Foundations. But this was a study um, inspired by a study that was done in Detroit in 1967, which we tried to gather empirical evidence that would tell us why the riots started and how they spread. And just to recap, um, for those of you who weren't following events closely in England in August, the riots were the, were the most serious bout of civil unrest in a generation. In a period of four days, um, a small protest in Tottenham expanded across London, north and south, to Manchester, Nottingham, Liverpool, uh, Birmingham. More than 15,000 people took to the streets, five people died, half a billion pounds worth of damage. So really quite serious and unprecedented, in fact, in the scale and nature of what happened. Um, and yet in the aftermath of these riots, Nobody really knew why they'd happened. So uh, there were, I guess, quite predictable theories emerging from the political realm. The, the right wing were blaming parental irresponsibility, um, a lack of moral fiber. Uh, the left were claiming that these were not riots, but perhaps protests against the impending austerity cuts. But there was nothing in terms of evidence. So this was our our objective with the London School of Economics to try to gather evidence about why the riots had started. I should say as well that the one thing that across the political divide everybody agreed upon was that technology, particularly social media uh, and particularly Twitter, were instrumental and were used by rioters to organize and incite violence. So that was accepted as, as fact. So we looked into this, and to briefly explain what we did, we located and interviewed 270 people who were directly involved in the riots. And we also had a database of more than 2.6 million riot-related tweets. So the actual messages that were circulating on the Twitter sphere during the riots and about the riots. Um, 
And I could talk to you a lot about different types of findings that we had, but I think the one that's most pertinent to this session today is about technology and how technology was being used. The first thing to say is that um, in response to the widely assumed fact, in inverted commas, that Twitter was key, um, the government and senior police officers uh, sought to take action. So the Metropolitan Police, which has jurisdiction over London, um, considered turning off Twitter, so turning off a tool for communication to prevent it being used by rioters. And the Prime Minister subsequently said that he wanted to, to convene a working party from senior police and security services to work out when it was right to intervene in technologies like these to stop them from being used in times of crisis. So that was the theory. Uh, the problem was, uh, and we've established this now, that um, our analysis of that database of 2.6 million tweets and our interviews with the rioters have established that actually Twitter wasn't used to communicate uh, by the rioters. Um, in fact, actually what happened was the moment anybody tweeted information that was incendiary, which was encouraging people to take to the streets and take part in violence, this was an open platform in which there was a deluge almost immediately of people silencing uh, that proposition. So quite the contrary, in fact. It was used in large parts to quell pe people from taking part. The thing that Twitter was used most for uh, was actually sharing information, a kind of civic role, um, and then subsequently for the cleanup. There was a huge attempt to clean the streets of debris after the riots had finished, and, and that's what Twitter was used for most. Um, Secondly, rumours. Uh, we all know that social media is used uh, uh, often inadvertently, but it d disseminates rumours. And that happened. That happened a lot. There were some rumours, some of them quite comical. Uh, one which flew around the world quite quickly was this suggestion that London Zoo had been broken into by rioters and there were animals, including monkeys and elephants, roaming the streets. Um, and it wasn't true. Uh, but what was interesting about how rumours operate and the anatomy of these rumours online is that Twitter has a self-regulating capacity. Uh, so in the same way as anybody who was inciting hatred, encouraging people to take, onto the, onto, take to the streets, were quickly silenced, Rumours were very quickly corrected, um, faster in fact than they spread. The third thing was that Facebook, contrary to widespread speculation, again wasn't used by rioters to organise and to incite. There were a few minor examples of people posting messages on Facebook, uh, advertising locations where people should convene to riot or to loot. Um, these high profile cases resulted in some of the harshest penalties after conviction. Five years, two individuals received for posting messages on their Facebook telling people to riot in certain places at certain times. In both occasions, the riots never took place, but the people responsible, of course, were prosecuted. But on the whole, as with Twitter, Facebook wasn't used in this way. So how did people communicate? Uh, well, the interesting thing uh, is that technology was central to how people were communicating. It was central to how people were organising themselves on the street, how they were preparing uh, and determining where they were going to go, and the types of activities they were involved in. But it wasn't an open technology. It was BlackBerry Messenger. Um, so for those who don't know, BlackBerry phones have a, a form of communicating which is encrypted. It's a closed network, very si similar to any social network. Um, but of course, the law enforcement authorities don't know what you're sending when you send messages on, on, on BlackBerry or BBM. Uh, and BBM was used extensively. So on the day of the worst riots in England, the third day, there were messages going around, people waking up, hearing their phones beep. Uh, and they would have an itinerary of where to go if they wanted to get involved in rioting and looting. Uh, and I think there are uh, many reasons why you could posit a hypothesis as to why BlackBerry was used in this way and Twitter and Facebook were not. But there's one very, very obvious one, um, which is simply that the, people, the, the, the messages that people were posting may have been stupid, uh, but the people themselves weren't stupid. And they weren't going to engage in criminal acts, incite criminal acts in a public forum that police could notice and watch and they could subsequently be prosecuted for. So I think that just kind of brings me to, to the one point that I thought might be useful to make. Um, 
And that's that it seems to me that the general discussion so far, and the discussion as it will unfold in the next day and day and a half, centers around um, regulation of uh, open media sources, whether they be newspapers or forums on the internet where people can post or social messaging networks. Um, but what we saw unfold in England, and it was you know, the worst bout of uh, violence in a generation, you'd have to go back to the 1980s for anything comparable, was pretty much organized on a closed network that would be impossible to regulate, that p police have no, no way of finding out how it was used and when it was used. Um, so I'll finish on that point. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Paul. That's perfect timing. Um, the next speaker uh, will be Natasha Yudina. Natasha comes from Russia and uh, she has rich experience to work in um, SOVA, non-governmental organization. SOVA is also based in Russia and focuses on monitoring ultra-nationalist uh, activities and also hate speech uh, on, on the internet and in Russian media in general. Natasha, in her speech, uh, will give us uh, examples of uh, her work uh, with SOVA and on monitoring of hate speech um, in the online media, and she will also speak about uh, the attempts of Russian government to intervene um, into the online content on the basis of hate speech. Natasha, the floor is yours. Good day. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, excuse me for my English. Uh, it, it is not fluent, so I will read my statement. Dear colleagues, uh, I work for Savat Center for Information and Analysis, a non-governmental organization in Russia. Our center focuses on issues related to nationalism, xenophobia, relationship between religion and society, and inappropriate enforcement of anti-extremist legislation. Our work in all these areas heavily, heavily depends on our access to the World Wide Web. This is particularly true on monitoring, which constitutes an important part of our daily activities. Hate speech presents a serious problem in Russia in general, and for Russian segment of the internet in particular. In this respect, we need to take two factors into account. The first factor is dramatically low permissibility threshold in comparison with Europe for demonstrating ethnic or religious intolerance in public speech. The second factor is high level of hate crimes, which in turn brings much greater attention to hate speech. It has to be noted that the authorities have recognized this problem a long time ago, and the number of convictions of hate speech has grown quite large. In 2011, 81 people were found guilty, and almost the same number of convictions had been recorded during the two previous years. Please note that the custodial sentences are seldom given for mere propaganda. The number of such convictions stands approximately at 15 cases per year. And even these cases usually involve other kind of misconduct as well. We applaud active law enforcement, but it also causes some concerns. We have recorded some cases of inappropriate convictions, and even in those cases where a statement fit the hate speech definition, it's frequently debatable whether it presented sufficient incendiary danger to justify opening a criminal case. As I said, in 2011, out of 81 people found guilty of racist propaganda and incitement of hate. 50 offenders were convicted for their online statements, including websites 18, social networks and forums 29, video sharing on local networks 2, sending materials via mail 1. We don't always know the exact content and wording of problematic statements. The cases without merit have likely been much more prevalent. In this respect, there are frequent debates regarding general applicability of the Criminal Court Articles 282, incitement to hatred to the Internet. The content of Article 280 and 282 applies to all public statements and has to include the online speech as well. However, appropriately applying these criminal court articles used for the majority of the internet-related cases of 2011 requires the court to estimate the extent of public exposure. 
Therefore, for the problematic statements, the audience size should be evaluated in addition to the statement's content evaluation. For example, in the case of a printed newspaper articles, the newspaper's circulation numbers provide us with a real realistic estimate of potential audience. Estimating potential audi audience for, a, for an online statement is much more complicated. Obviously, we cannot assume that all the internet users constitute potential audience. In case of an article published on a regular website, we can assume that the potential audience size equals the number of, size visit, of site visitors. But it is not clear what time and tunnel is appropriate for estimating the visit account. Moreover, it is not always possible to accept to ascertain the number of past visitors. Along the same lines, in case of, of a social network or forums, we cannot base uh, uh, our estimates on number of visitors across the entire of, of a very extensive forum or number of users of an entire site, such as Facebook. Instead, we need to consider the size of particular segment, such as a forum section, a social network group or community, a circle of friend, friends of sub, sub, subscribers who follow the author or publisher of the statement in question. At this point, point quantitative assessments become, became even more problematic. However, in order to achieve a fair verdict, they still need to be made at last to a certain degree. The extent of public exposure remains a relevant issue even if an online group of, is restricted, i.e. if reading the content requires special authorization. Such restricted group can be very large, and then a statement may, made within the virtual space should be considered public. However, if the author addresses a specific selected group of readers by name, then the section can no longer be considered a public statement directed at an undefined group of people. All this question could be resolved by the Supreme Court, but until further clarifications arrive, we have to evaluate the extent of publicity on the case-by-case -case basis, gradually developing practical guidelines. Unfortunately, so far the extent of publicity has never been taken into account. In our opinion, the majority of publications and statements that ended up in courts of 2011 did not have sufficient visibility and accessibility to constitute actual public danger, and therefore should not have faced criminal prosecution. In addition, among the offenders convicted of 2011, there were almost no well-known propagandists who regularly engaged in xenophobic propaganda with public incitement to violence. The defenders were predominantly bloggers of uh, limited popularity, high school students, younger university students, or students of vocational schools. Definitely not all the hate propaganda-related criminal cases are without merit. For example, a notable conviction last year happened in the case of 20-year-old Denis Kuznetsov, the leader of neo-Nazi group Northeast 88, whose members are suspected in a series of attacks and murders. Participation of the group's leader and ideologist in the attacks was never proven, so he was convicted to one year in custody for propaganda. Prosecution for hate speech in Russia can be either criminal or administrative. The latter is based on court prohibition of certain text, videos, or song, songs which are then ordered to the federal list of extremist materials. In general, the quality of federal list is very low, and efficiency for blocking hate speech is practically non-existent. Leaving aside the conceptual value of the federal list of extremist materials, we are convinced that this unique for modern Europe experiment has failed and should simply be abandoned. The very existence of the list has generated a problem of blocking online access to so-called extremist materials. The issue in itself created numerous problems for internet access providers and even for libraries and schools. Russian courts, including the Supreme Court, are still unable to find a reasonable resolution for resulting controversy. 
We believe the problem discussed in my current statement is rooted in an excessively broad notion of hate speech, codified within the law of countering extremist activity. Before attempting to resolve particular legal conflict, the definition of prohibited speech must be significantly narrowed. We believe this sh should only include direct and publicly visible incitement to violence and discrimination. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia, for uh, this interesting account of uh, practice in Russia and think this can inspire some of our Hungarian colleagues to reflect a little bit uh, on uh, the Hungarian media law, uh, which includes, of course, uh, measures on hate speech as well. And uh, the law covers uh, not only broadcasting media, audiovisual media, but also print and online press in this respect in, in the case of hate speech. So uh, its potential use can be very, very similar. Okay, um, and our final speaker will be Daniel Paul coming from uh, Sweden. Um, he is the editor-in-chief uh, of Expo magazine, which is uh, published online, and uh, he is also chief officer for Expo Foundation. Uh, Expo uh, was uh, formed as a, a magazine um, uh, in, in mid-90s in Sweden to counteract, actually, um, hate speech and uh, right-wing uh, um, extremism in um, Danish uh, public sphere in the period when uh, this uh, movements uh, were on rise, and I think uh, we witness at the moment very similar tendencies in, in many European countries, especially in, in terms of uh, critique of multiculturalism. So, uh, Daniel will speak about um, the uh, Swedish perspective, um, and he will focus on uh, hate speech in online media, online environment. Daniel, floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. It's been a very interesting day so far, and many interesting um, uh, speeches. Um, I will try to put in something of, from, from, from Expo's point of view into this discussion. Uh, and I would like to start that with an old man called Sven Arne Lundehell. Uh, I work as a journalist, and was like seven years ago that I did an interview with this guy, an old man living on an island in a filthy uh, house with a hole in the roof. Uh, Sven Lundehel was a national socialist, uh, very determined national socialist, uh, and he was a very lonely man so lonely that he invited me as a political opponent to come visit him and drink coffee. Um, but that didn't stop him from trying to spread his views. He, has his, he had his own magazine called the Bohuslens Folkblad, a kind of local paper for, for that area where he lives in the southwestern part of Sweden. He also had guests sometimes, young far-right activists traveled 40 kilometers by bus to travel to, to meet this old man, listen to his stories from the Second World War, and writing swastikas in his, face, in his guest book. Uh, in many ways, Sven Arne Lundehel is the kind of old type of far-right activist. The post-Second World War far-right activist with, with very big problems with reaching out with his message. Uh, internet, of course, changed everything. Today, Sven Arne Lundehel, if he were been alive, could have started a blog. He could have posted all his fantastic pictures on Facebook. He could have written all those articles in a way that would be much, much more uh, available for people. And he could, first of all, be networking with people, not being forced to, to force people traveling 40 kilometers to meet him. So in a time like this, Sven Ole Lundehal wouldn't have been that lonely as he was like seven years ago. The far right, which Expo is monitoring, has always been very quick in using new media platforms. 
from private radio stations in Sweden, uh, private radio stations in Sweden in the 80s, and videos, uh, and of course, internet and social media. Internet is, of course, the most, the absolutely biggest revolution for the far right and for any political extreme group. Uh, it gives an opportunity to to put out your ideas very cheap, very fast, and to connect with people in a way that was impossible before. It's interesting, though, to, to, to see that the actually, if we look at the Swedish situation, hasn't been very good in using social media to organize people. It's not that they're using Facebook or Twitter to, 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 to get people to demonstrations. It's not that people usually show their faces in Facebook groups. And this is, of course, because it's a political environment where you usually uh, feel most, most uh, comfortable being, being a secret member but it's the perfect platform for spreading IDs. Uh, and having said that, I would like to underline the fact that I don't think that, because it sounds, sounds like that when we're discussing today, I don't think that intolerance and racism is necessarily growing in, in, in Europe, especially not in Sweden. Service shows that acceptance for multicultural society, society is actually growing but the intolerance is more visible. Uh, and that is what we're confronting. We're not confronting a growing racism uh, all over Europe. Well, in some countries, yes, but not in the big picture, and not least in Sweden. We're confronting the idea that the intolerance and the hate is being visible. And that puts up a lot of questions, of course. First of all, I think it's important to recognize that hate speech is not only visible, on the intolerant websites, not only in the blogs that the kind of far-right activist starts, but only also in YouTube, in Facebook, in forums that usually are, are, are put up on internet to discuss family life or pets. People with intolerance IDs takes, take every opportunity they have to spread their IDs, which sometimes lead to hate speech. You can also find hate speech in the comments to, to kind of the mainstream media's articles, uh, where we for a very long time have had a mainstream media taking no responsibility at all. Uh, and I think basically when it comes to the legislation of hate speech we're in a situation where i mean whatever you think of it and however you want the legislation to look like we have to recognize and realize that it's very unmodern it's not shaped for a world with internet and i think that is maybe one of the biggest questions that we're confronting we have to deal with this in a new time and that maybe that is why people don't understand what hate speech is about in Sweden, we have a situation where people complaining to the police about uh, statements made by the biggest um, right-wing populist party, the Sweden Democrats, where the party leader says that he don't want uh, a multicultural society. Is that hate speech? I mean, if that is hate speech, we can't have a debate at all about Euro how Europe should look like. Uh, you shouldn't mix up ideas with hate speech. And I think that's, that is very important uh, because we have a situation in Europe where there is actually not only hate speech that we can forbid and then we're rid of the problem. We have a situation in Europe where there is a struggle about how Europe should look like with different parties, with different ideas. That is what we're seeing. That is what we're confronting and that's what we're in the middle of. Hate speech is a problem because it, we know from history what it can lead to. But we can't deal with this situation just only by uh, kind of forbidding the IDs. That means that we have to deal with this as a political phenomenon. We have hate speech because we have intolerance, and intolerance is therefore the problem, basically. So we have to deal with intolerance. And I think we're in a situation where we don't have that many ways of doing that. 
Especially, we are not willing to accept the idea that intolerance is a part of our society, is, if we want to spell it in that way, a part of, of the European culture. Uh, to confront intolerant ideas, you have to work in a long term. You have to have patience, you have to, like for example, one of the projects that we're doing that we, when we take care of, uh, young kids in the, in the, in the, in the age of 14 uh, in an ed education where we actually have them for two years. That's the time it will take to change a young kid's view when it comes to intolerance. It's not fixed by uh, very um, hallelujah looking uh, campaigns. It's fixed by long-term patiently work. And I think what we're dealing with is a political situation where we also have to realize that we're kind of stuck in an ID of Europe. And it's actually, if you want to, you want to put something into the debate here, uh, it's um, constructed here today as well, as European, Europe as a continent consisting of Europeans and minorities. We have to be able to look at Europe and be able to look at the people who lives in our societies in a more constructive way, in a way where we are not only looking at immigrants and minorities as, that, as, as if that were the only thing they were. Um, that's all for me. Hopefully there will be questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, all speakers, for fantastic presentations that uh, provided us with a lot of inspirations, I think. Uh, so now we can start discussion. Yeah, who would like to start with uh, some comments, ideas to share? No one? <laughs> At the beginning. Yes, Miklos, please. Um, as you virtually called on me, I, I just would like to reiterate that uh, the Russian presentation was really very uh, illuminating. But the similarity with the Hungarian case um, ends there. It is not enforced in Hungary. And the non-enforcement of it in Hungary is used as another message for the far right. And that's where I would like to end my, my remark. Uh, the remarkable in Hungary is that out of the two major pretexts for why Hungary needed that new um, media governance regime, one is the fight to hate speech, and the other is making it cheaper. Um, compared public media um, in two years, almost doubled the taxpayer money that it uses. So that is not true either. And the hate, hate speech issue is not. This is not to go into the subject uh, um, where I fully agree with the Russian presentation, um, not because the non-enforcement. I think it could be more enforced, but but... Generally speaking, I agree with the conclusion of the presentation that, that um, out-turn regulation to media, to enforce inclusiveness and to enforce internal pluralism, not just has its limits, but it has growing limits with the blow up of the concept of media, of the concept of internet with the multiplication of channels, with the general trend towards, um, towards um, um, Rush Limbo's and Hungarian Here TV's and, and all other kind of things. Um, rather, another session about how to enforce outturn pluralism could be a better answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then Peter and gentlemen over there. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to come back, if possible, shortly to counter speech. So Paul talked a bit about how 
on how on social media actually counters speech work that more people were discouraging the rioting and uh, robbery than those who were encouraging it. So I wonder whether you have something to say perhaps additionally on how, in what ways and to what extent counter speech again, re as a response to so-called hate speech, especially by the targeted minorities, uh, migrated online. And I mentioned that in Hungary, for example, the uh, earlier there was a Roma radio station, Radio C, the C is from the Hungarian word cigány for Roma, and, uh, and that station unfortunately is not on air any longer. By the way, it was not a big news that it disappeared. Also, a printed uh, Roma magazine, Amaro Drom, uh, is also uh, not existing any longer, but there are some, some Roma online media which has been created recently. So, uh, of course, it's a, for different reasons, it's cheaper, easier to sustain, and it's a big problem, again, with supporting, facilitating counter speech enough. But so I wonder what do you think about that in the context of what you have been describing? Okay, thank you. Then your comment, please. When I think about the situation of of media, what's happening today in the world of media, I think that the most important is to see, to realize that we are facing like a tension between uh, a process that is like an explosion of windows of communication and also a process of concentration. We can see what's happening in Europe with a main groups on that are concentrating the ownership of the most important media in Europe. It's something that's happening in the States, in South America, in Europe. And the main issue is between this tension of this concentration and this explosion of windows of communication. That's happening in internet, but not only in internet. I'm thinking in Spain, by the way. In Spain, we have 44 TDTs, free air, 44. And there is also an explosion that is not always positive for pluralism. It's not always good for pluralism. That's one thing that I wanted to say this morning, and I, I would like to say that it's not only a question of internet, it's more a general process that we are facing in the situation. And the second thing that we have been talking about very concrete and very interesting issues about uh, Roma, about different groups, and we are talking about hate speech, uh, a clear facts of hate speech. What, but what's happening with this new hate speech more subtle, more weak, that is present in some countries. I think in Spain, we have one Spanish national TDT open free air space that is like our Fox News in Spain. What will happen in Europe if we have a Fox News in UK or in France or in Germany? We are ready to have a Fox News in our country free aerospace with, a, with, a, with a, um, uh, this cane of a speech that you don't know really where the information starts and where the opinion is to start. I think that is a question that I think we need to reflect when we are going to talk about Europe and our future media system. And I do think, and my experience also as a regulator, that I think that it's really important, the self-regulation, but we need a strong agreement between public powers, between uh, civic society, about uh, a clear framework to avoid the hate speech and also this kind of more weak and subtle hate speech. 
that are present in some societies of Europe. Uh, uh, and, um, and for me, the future is more Europe, more European regulation that can provide a clear framework to, uh, to work against this kind of speech. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, Frank, wanted to have a comment. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a couple of comments. Um, one is when we left this morning, and I think it's relevant for, for beginning this afternoon, we were commenting that the whole focus this morning was in terms of media, um, why is there so misjudgment in terms of what is important in terms of the news? And the, one of the most important criteria that was mentioned is that because the big media at least and the editors are going for profit for the what is the news that sells, what is the news that makes the newspaper more, more palatable or interesting, and this is clearly the example of Rupert Murdoch. Um, but it, in a way, uh, I think this is exactly one of the problems we have to look at is how to confront that with returning to the fact that the media and journalism in general plays another role, which is the mission to inform society. And there has to be the idea that it is a profitable enterprise is fine as long as it also complies with the other side of it, which is it informs professionally and objectively, like Aidan was defending. There has to be a, a certain element, not only of ethics, but of professionalism or quality of the information. And, and this gets lost. And I think here's where even the scandalous stories are interesting, because this is what, what sells. But it also says about us that in society we have allowed the commercial perspective to prevail. My feeling, I mean, newspapers have always been commercial, or 99% or of them. Uh, big media has always been commercial, but in the past there was a certain element of pride, of professional pride in doing a job well done. And I think, in a way, this is being lost to the anonymity of, of profit. I mean, the whole question of, of greed. And I think this is a problem. And this brings other problems with it, which is the accumulation of big media, the big conglomerates, then the monopolies and all that, that also are a challenge to the pluralism and diversity that we mentioned. In Latin America, my experience um, is that, for instance, in, in my own country, Guatemala, we don't even have a regulation to allow community broadcast. They, they talk about community radios, but those really don't exist. You have educational radios that were authorized for the, for the church, different churches, many years ago, but there are really no community radios because they're not in the law. The idea that there could be a non-profit radio is unconceivable. And the only way to access a frequency is by a public auction. And, and we challenged the, the public auction before the constitutional court, saying that what happens to the local indigenous communities that don't have the resources. And it was interesting because the constitutional court turned us down and said the law is being applied equally to everyone. The fact that not everyone has the same amount of economic resources is just circumstantial. <laughs> but it's clear, so clearly there was an element, they, they were not willing to move the system and to have a proactive and a positive uh, element in this. Secondly, um, on this question of, of minorities, we, my majorities, we have a majority indigenous population in my country, and there's a friend of mine who has uh, the Catedra UNESCO, the UNESCO lecture on, on uh, uh, multiculturalism, and she did a study of how the press covers the news when it's with Mayan population, and it was interesting. All the photographs never have names under them. They will have the photo and they'll say, Mayan leaders did so and so, or Mayan communities and their leaders, but we'll never identify them by name. So these became, although they were there in the picture, they would maybe do it with Rigoberta Menchu because she's a Nobel laureate, but all the others were the anonymous Mayan leaders. So clearly, and this was being repeated, uh, they would have other forms. Every time they had a news item on poverty, they would bring out an old sort of archive photo with Mayan communities and they would put them on, on, on the, so the, the article would always equate being Mayan with poverty. 
So when she had a meeting with editors of newspapers and showed them this, she told me that the majority of them were profoundly and honestly shocked. They themselves had not even recognized the elements of racism they were manifesting in the newspaper. It was not even intentional. But obviously it is very ingrained. I mean, racism is a very ingrained issue in the country and it's just, it, it has somewhat been corrected a little bit. It was the peace process, but it's clearly still very much in the social attitudes and, and, and composure. So the, the point I was making is that we, we have to make the media reflect on these issues to the extent that oftentimes racism creeps in. I think we can make this reflection with honest journalists that are oftentimes racist or discriminatory with really not noticing it, with just reflecting the point of view of society. But we also have to look at this sort of other phenomenon of the creeping in phenomenon of, of business is everything. And, and, and if there's no profit, there's no good, or the bigger the profit, the more important the news. Because that in itself is also allowing, I mean, obviously there's clear examples in Europe, and Europe is the example of public media, so public broadcasting. I mean, the BBC or Radio Netherlands uh, are a few examples of, of what good public uh, enterprises can do in an independent way. But, but how much is that being threatened? by the budget cuts and the possibility of creeping in. Uh, Rupert Murdoch was about to buy one of the television channels in Britain. I mean, so it, again, it's important to reflect on this, to, to protect these little islands and issues that, that, uh, that we have. No? Thank you so much. Uh, George, please. <clears throat> I want to say something very short regarding this issue. Uh, I think this problem how has hate speech been created online can be resolved only if we want. In Romania, the radio and television uh, has a national council for audiovisual. If I saw on a television on a television a show in which someone has a racist declaration, this council for uh, national audiovisual has a weekly meeting and will uh, judge this uh, show and will sanction the television. I think this kind of institu institution have to be made for internet and website of the newspapers too. In my opinion, we are working in Romania at this kind of uh, project. Uh, this kind of institution can uh, uh, tell to the newspapers as the journalist who is writing the article to moderate the comments because the problem is with the free people <laughs> and who are commenting the articles and the comments are free. The author of the article can moderate the comments and he can choose which comment is uh, racist, which comment contains xenophobia content. This is very simple. In Romania, when I write an article, I put it on the website and I have the password and I can see the comments. I can judge the comments. This is very simple. In my opinion, if a newspaper will not respect this uh, thing, maybe this institution will sanction the newspaper. Thank you. Thank you. So this is a very interesting example of uh, counteracting <laughs> hate speech through uh, new online services. Okay, um, you had a question? Yeah. Thank you. I want to thank the panelists for providing a more fine-grained view of hate speech online um, and also insights into which technologies or rather services are driving hate speech uh, more than others. Uh, my question to actually all three panelists though would be, given you're more intimate, familiar with hate speech online than some of the rest of us, uh, which conclusions do you draw from what you are observing for actually governmental regulation of the internet, if any. Want to start? 
Um, yes, Bob, yeah, please. I'll, well, I'll keep it quick, partly because I think people are speaking for a really long time, um, but maybe that's just my perspective. Um, the conclusions, well, uh, firstly, that um, regulation shouldn't be knee-jerk and instinctive. So the response to the riots was, was both knee-jerk and instinctive, and it was therefore misplaced. So they were, uh, in one sense, regulating the wrong technology. The second is that technology will always be one step ahead of forms of regulation. I, I can't imagine it will be too long until a similar form of encrypted networked messaging like BlackBerry Messenger is available to everybody regardless of the handset that they're using. Um, and if that were to happen, then it would be impossible to regulate. Okay. Um, Danielle, would you like to comment? Because there was a question, so three presenters and then, then you can follow, yeah? Well, um, I mean, if, if the Swedish example, uh, well, we already have legislation when it comes to hate speech on internet, for example. So, yeah, I think so. But I, I don't think that we should forbid IDs, and that's, that's my point. Uh, there is, a, of course, a point where, where IDs go, turns into hate speech, and that, that should be, as it is today, not, not okay. Natalia, say a few words uh, as the last presenter. <laughs> To the question. Uh -huh. As I said earlier, uh, the main problem is Russia, that the definition of extremist featuring in the, in the federal law on counter extremism is too vague. Uh, it, and uh, the main advice to narrow this <laughs> in law. Yeah, that's quite clear. Okay, and you had a comment or question? A comment and maybe to open up the debate. I'm Marco from, from Google. And um, I, I was wondering about some of the things that were said today and around the role of uh, hate speech uh, in terms of a possible problem for social cohesion or a problem that should be addressed with uh, uh, legislation, actually, censorship. And I think uh, uh, we should all ask to ourselves uh, Actually, this looks to me like a typical chicken-egg problem. If uh, fighting just censorship, then we think to solve all the problems of the tension in the society, or maybe just uh, working on the problems and the tension in the society, we can probably help to fix uh, aid, aid speech. And uh, on top of that, when we think about new legislation for for in, for the internet, for new technology, for all the new phenomenon, and we hope that in the future we will have to face this kind of problems, uh, <laughs> positive problems of uh, open space for debate even more. Why don't we try to think that the rules of the, the real world are also applying to the internet? So why don't we try to consider how the rules that we are all following in our civil society, in the real world, could be applied to the internet in a balanced way in terms of the different fundamental rights at stake. And Peter had a question? Oh, yes, you, sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I just wanted to, uh, to point a few things. This morning, Aidan was, uh, was referring to the fact that new mainstream media, uh, we need to look at them from a business model perspective. And when you look at them from a business model perspective, you understand that they need to add value to find like customers. Uh, now, this value can be added into two different ways. Number one, the news effect, the timing of the information. Number two, the quality effect, the quality of the analysis and the treatment, the media treatment that they, that they make. Now, with the social networks, uh, the traditional media, they don't have like, this news impact anymore, uh, this, uh, this timing impact anymore. And at the same time, uh, internet makes it possible for any of us to become an analyst, a commentator, a journalist. Okay? So the first thing we need to look at is um, the opportunity for media is to recompose and to move from a news model, uh, news business model, into an analytical uh, business model. The journalists today that have an audience, uh, they don't have an audience necessarily because they bring out the information first, but also because their angle, uh, the way they look at the specific information, uh, is literally informative. It adds value. 
The second thing is, and this is a problem, uh, it means that on the internet there is no hierarchy of the information. Uh, and the problem that we have, for example, in France is that some uh, right-wing extremist movements, they have a huge audience on the internet and they would have a treatment of the news, they, they would have a treatment of the, of, the, of the events that happen in the country and they would have tens of thousands looking at their website daily and these citizens, they build their information, they shape their perception of their environment through these websites. So um, Paul was pointing to a kind of a self-regulation of, uh, of, uh, of the social networks uh, in, the, in the case of the riots in London where, for example, when a rioter would incite people to go on the, on the street, the other uh, Twitter uh, members, they would say, that's not reasonable, you shouldn't be doing this. But in the case where the ID that is spread is much more subtle, uh, much more perverse in the deconstruction of the, of the lie or the manipulation, it's going to be very difficult for the social network, the social group to act as a regulation force. So my question is, all of, uh, to, all, uh, to all of the audience, how do you think we can give back some, uh, some sense of hierarchy uh, in the informative value of the, of, the, of the messages that are spread on the internet? And, we, and if we don't go for a kind of a legal mechanism for, uh, for forbidding the, the, the hate speech on the internet, how can, can we reinforce kind of a regulation mechanism that would be intelligent and dynamic enough to recompose itself based on the context? Thank you. Okay, now Aidan and, and Marie. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I just want to sort of go back to the sort of suggestion that, um, that was coming from Paul, who was basically saying that, and probably he's right about this, that the technology is such that formal regulation of content is actually going to become increasingly difficult, if not impossible. But there is a question here about whether or not there should be common regulation or an attempt for a common regulation. Because this meeting is, as, as I understand it, about media, media pluralism and hate speech and so on. And there are two issues here. One is the context of media and the way that media and journalism operates. And there's also what you might call the wider information space, that sort of uncontrolled information space, the public information space. And I, and, and I, and for for example, I think that there's every reason to believe that there can be formal methods of regulation of internet content from, for instance, media sources, from what you might call journalistic sources, because information comes out through a converged media environment in all sorts of different platform ways, but actually it's a, it's a stream that comes from journalism itself. So. It, uh, and it seems to me that that's what's important. I can imagine, for example, some form of press authority which is self-regulating, which is actually looking at all forms of media and journalistic content on all platforms and applying a common set of values and rules about how that should be treated. I mean, I'm not quite sure. It, it's, it's not then going to be dealing with the question of the sort of uh, the, the, the closed network problems that's referred to here and maybe other forms of regulation are required. But I think we need to be... We, 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 we seem to be trapped in the notion that when we talk about the internet, we're talking about one enormous spectrum, and within that, the only response can be one enormous form of regulation. And I wonder whether or not that is the right way to look at it, and whether or not we should be seeing, for instance, there is a distinction between online content and internet content, which is what you might call journalistic, or, or originates from a sort of journalistic base or a media base, and, and other, other speech and other expression, and that maybe different forms of regulation may be necessary. Okay, um, Marie and then Frank. Yeah, quickly, I, I just wanted to ask a favor of Paul, if he could just elaborate in two words on the tripartite approach that The Guardian had to reporting uh, the riots, because I don't know if the audience fully understood uh, the innovative approach you, you, you took, which is beyond uh, analysis and, of, of Twitter and uh, the use of, of technology. So if, if, if you wouldn't mind just to t take a couple of words, because it, it addresses open journalism that uh, Aidan spoke uh, to, and it also uh, addresses context, so the context uh, against which uh, intolerant speech is, is reported upon. Okay, well... Um uh, I mean, this, this term, open journalism, is, uh, is part of The Guardian's brand, in fact. Um, and and it really, it, it comes down to the notion that journalism has changed in such a profound way um, that w we no longer find ourselves in a position where we try to, to work out what we, as the, the journalists, believe to be true and then impart that knowledge. 
to a passive reader, and then that, 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 at that point it's, um, the transaction is complete. But we now have a position in which we are much far more collaborative, and we accept that we can find out a lot more uh, by collaborating with and working with the people who are at the same time kind of consuming our news. So it's a kind of a two-way interaction, and it's born from that philosophy that we, we hold events such as the, the open weekend, which I was um, taking part in this weekend and others were, were present at also. And it's in that spirit that we conceived of this uh, project, Reading the Riots. Um, as I mentioned before, it was inspired by this, this collaboration between a newspaper, the Detroit Free Press, um, and, and uh, academics in Michigan in the aftermath of the Detroit riots in 1967. And in those riots, they, they hired black teachers to go out into the communities to interview people who were involved in the disturbances. To, to conduct some kind of sociological analysis as to why they'd happened. So what we did was, was similar, but of course, you know, I guess of a, I mean, that was a product of, of, of an era and ours was slightly different in many, in many me kind of methodological ways. But with the London School of Economics, we, we went out, uh, advertised for what you would essentially call citizen journalists of a kind. We wanted people to uh, interview people who were rioters. Um, and we had 450 people apply for this role. Uh, we, hire, we interviewed 60 of them, um, hired 30. And these were researchers based in London, Birmingham, Manchester, Nottingham, all of the cities where there had been riots. And we trained them uh, to interview people. And these were, as you can imagine, very difficult interviews. Interviews with people who were admitting, confessing to really quite serious crimes. Um, but doing so, of course, on the basis of confidentiality. Um, so, so it was a a unique experiment in the sense that we were, as journalists, um, partnering with you know, academics for a start, um, but also citizens who we entrusted to do the type of work that normally you would expect journalists to do on their own. I think the product has been, uh, I'm biased, but um, we're very happy with it. I mean, in terms of the impact we had on the public debate, I think it's been very significant. Um, you know, when you set out and enterprises like this, the thing that you want to do more than anything else is find out something that you would never have expected to, to find out when, when, when you began. And on the issue of, of Twitter and social media, we were genuinely surprised that it hadn't had the impact it had. But there were a whole host of government policies um, from their response on gangs, because it was widely assumed that, that criminal gangs were leading the riots, and in fact we found out that that wasn't, that wasn't to be the case, to some of the grievances that were underlying that brought people out onto the streets that we would never have found if we hadn't undertaken this kind of a project. Okay, uh, thank you. And the last comment will be from Frank. Yeah. I, um, I must say that I, I find it fascinating to hear this experience of The Guardian. I, um, uh, I have not found uh, such a unique experience in other parts of, of the world. So I'm very pleased to hear it. And, and it, it, it would be nice to document it more as a that's a good practice, for instance. Um, let me, just a word of caution on, on the, the question of regulation. I, I do uh, understand what Natasha was saying from, from Russia uh, on specifically the broadness of the, of the law, and that is precisely the problem. When, when a regulation is too broad or the definitions are too vague, then it generates a problem. One of the conditions that we mentioned at the beginning for limitations to freedom of expression is that they have to be very precise precisely defined. And here, because otherwise the ambiguity will inevitably sometimes be misused for just simple negligence or sometimes be misused with political intentionality by who applies the law. But, but here it's, it's a fine line because not all offensive speech is necessarily hate speech. Uh, and this is difficult to understand, but I, I, I obviously, because of the mandate and because of my responsibility, fall on the liberal side of interpretation of issues. I get criticized by my own colleagues and friends in, in Guatemala all the time. But, but it's interesting because, for instance, I would ask here the audience, would have you called the Danish cartoons racists or not? And would have anyone forbidden the Danish cartoons? Because I caught myself right at the beginning of the mandate, was, that was like a year after I had taken the mandate, 
I found myself in the crisis of the Danish cartoons as one of the most difficult tasks because I was trying to prove to the Islamic conference that I do believe they're being profiled as terrorists and that they're suffering uh, prejudice by the rest of the world, but that I don't believe in censorship. Uh, so they made the point with the Danish cartoons with me, and I said, look, this is exactly... I took advantage of the cartoons to, to mark the difference. I said exactly what I believe. I think the Danish cartoons are an element of discrimination. They portray the Pro Prophet Muhammad with a bomb in his turban, clearly a, a in, insinuation of terrorism and obviously inciting to that. I think they're tasteless and they're senseless because they're not in tone with the sensitivities of the moment. I think they should have not been published. Uh, and I think they're an element of bad taste. But having said that, I will always defend the right of any newspaper to publish a cartoon. Because cartoons by nature are in jest, are mockery of an idea, a principle. And cartoons may often and most likely provoke indignation or affect the image or reputation of someone. And still the cartoons are a very important form of communication. So again, we, we must be cautious on, on the response of regulation. I think regulation has to exist, yes, but it has to exist. And by the way, I, I would never believe on a regulation for internet per se. Uh, one of the things I defended when people asked me whether internet needs a new set of rights, for me, internet should have the same principles applied to freedom of expression as a whole and to all media not to, to, to make something exclusive or different. It is much more powerful, of course, as every technological leap, but the same principle should apply to every single form of, of mass communication. Uh, and there, yes, there should be some regulation and there should be prohibitions, but we, we must never fall into the trap of excessive regulation because ultimately that, 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 that solution generates more harm than, than good. Uh, people made the reference here in Europe, the difference of how the Danish cartoons were handled vis-a-vis -vis the Fitna film in the Netherlands. And how the Fitna film was equally seen by Muslim people as offensive, portraying them as terrorism. But the, 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 the Dutch government made an effort to allow the film to be presented because of freedom of expression, but to distance themselves from that position, making it very clear that that did not represent the position of the government of the Netherlands and they did not agree with what was being said there, but they would still allow it to be presented because it was freedom of expression. And that softened the tension. There was never a crisis because of the Fitna film as there was on the Danish cartoons where there was no, exp no one wanted to take responsibility, no one wanted to, all they wanted was to present them and nor the editors, nor the government, nor anyone at that moment made a statement on it. And I think, again, here's where the context and the handling also makes a difference. But the, the point in summary is we cannot over-regulate freedom of expression for the benefit of, 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 of avoiding hate speech because then we're also harming the freedom. Thank you so much. I think this provoked a lot of thoughts about, about the issue and I think we can now discuss them during the coffee break. Thank you so much for the session. <laughs>